So hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I work on the chaos team at Netflix, and let's talk about antics, drift, and chaos. Uh, so I wanted to start off by talking about my uh, favorite outage that happened at Netflix. Um, so there's this large service that suffers from what we call cold start. Basically, when it starts up initially, it's not ready to take production traffic yet because it runs too slowly. Certain code paths have to get executed so that it warms up properly so that it can respond quickly enough. Uh, and one of the ways it gets warmed up is that uh, there are tests that execute when the service boots up. So one day, uh, there was a test added um, to the test suite for doing warm up that had to do with some downstream service. Uh, now, the tests that run on, on startup are divided into two categories. There are unit tests and there are functional tests. And the functional tests are distinguished from the unit tests by this annotation um, that gets put on. And the distinction between the way the unit tests and the functional tests run is that the unit tests run earlier in the life cycle, then some other stuff happens, and then the functional tests run. The problem was that that annotation was left off on this new test that was added. It depended on some code being executed in the life cycle that wasn't executed when the unit test ran, and it blew up. And the instances couldn't start up properly, uh, and we had an outage. Um, so to sum this up, this uh, test that was correct, that ran as a unit test, um, led to uh, an outage happening in Netflix. So I think the moral here is, is pretty obvious. Um, you know, unit tests are dangerous. Uh, we have to be really careful with these sorts of things. We should really prefer larger scale tests uh, when, when we do development. Uh, of course, I don't actually believe that. Uh, the real moral here is that uh, complex systems act in really weird ways, right? If you were looking at, at review, that, that code is correct, that test is correct, um, and yet it still took down production. Uh, so I'm here today to talk about failure. Uh, in particular, I'm here to talk about um, system failure, how systems fail. Um, often we call these outages. Uh, more generally, we, we talk about them as incidents. And uh, I'm going to talk about three things in my talk today. So the first part is the, the how, how it is that these systems tend to fail. Uh, the second part is sort of why, why it is that our systems get into unsafe states. And finally, the, the what, uh, what we can do about it. So I'm going to start with the, with the how part, uh, which I'm calling antics. Uh, and so uh, this phrase, complex systems exhibit unexpected behavior, it's not my expression. It comes from John Gall. Gall was a pediatrician um, who wrote a book in the 70s called Systematics about complex systems and how they behave in really weird ways. Uh, and it is surprising how much of that stuff that he wrote about is relevant to us building distributed systems today. And so I'm going to be drawing a lot in my talk um, from the, the work that Gall did and his observations on how systems behave in weird ways. Um, so he has this thing called the generalized uncertainty principle, um, which he summarized as systems display antics, hence the name of, of antics, that, this part of the talk. Uh, I'm also going to be drawing a lot of, of my material from Sidney Decker. Decker is a, a safety science researcher. Uh, his background is in aviation. I think he's a licensed commercial aviation pilot. Um, and he's written a lot about um, how it is the systems get into, into unsafe states. So we'll hear more about Decker a little bit later on in, in the talk. All right, let's talk about error handling. Um, so when we build distributed systems, most of the time something is going to be going wrong if the system is large enough or runs for a long enough period of time. The network has all sorts of transient problems, right? Um, the switches and routers get congested and packets get dropped on the floor and so things time out uh, and we need to be able to handle that. Or, you know, a disk will go bad, a whole server will go bad. Um, so we need to be able to handle um, errors that happen in our system because they're just happening all the time. Uh, and there's this great paper um, a few years ago by researchers at the University of uh, Toronto uh, that were looking at um, bad failures that happened in open source projects that are commonly used in distributed systems. So things like Cassandra and Redis and Hadoop MapReduce and HBase. Um, and one of the, the observations that they made looking at people reporting you know, big failures in the field um, was that almost all the, what they call the catastrophic failures, so these are the, the failures that led to a widespread outage or data loss, those were all due to some incorrect or missing error handling or exception handling logic, right? So we need to be able to handle errors to build uh, reliable systems. There's just, there's just no way around it. Uh, the problem is, as we try to deal with these, these errors, these problems, we create new problems for ourselves, and that's really what gets us into trouble. Um, so I'm going to take one example of that. Uh, so one example of a, 
of the technique we use to deal with, with errors is retries, right? So you make a call, an RPC call to a service, uh, it times out, and so you try again, commonly on, you know, on a different server. So consider this scenario. Uh, you have some kind of microservice architecture. Um, <laughs> one of your services goes bad. Um, maybe it was under-provisioned, and so it's running too hot. Uh, your service uh, starts to become latent, right? It starts to take more and more time to respond to requests. And so the clients that are calling it start to time out. What happens, the clients retry on timeout, but because that service is under-provisioned, all the servers are, are latent. Uh, that increases the load on them. Uh, the latency is then going to increase, right? More clients retry because the latency is increasing, there's more timeouts. And now you have a retry storm, right? So this pattern of failure is so common that we, we have a name for it. Right? And this is because we are trying to fix a, a, a transit problem. Um, so Gal has this idea that if you build fail-safe systems, they're going to fail in non-fail-safe ways. Uh, uh, and there's, there's two great papers recently um, that talk about this, um, both out of Microsoft. Um, so the first one was about, um, basically they're looking at different uh, failures in production systems like Azure and Amazon and Facebook, uh, I believe Google, where the system that was designed to do failure recovery made the problem worse, right? So the, the outage was due to the failure recovery system doing the wrong thing. And then there's another paper also out of Microsoft about um, these things called gray failures where the users think something's wrong, but your system can't figure that out, right? So the system doesn't know there's failures, but there actually are. Let's talk about support systems. Or, or another, another uh, way of saying this, why does Netflix need so many engineers? So we have uh, over 1,200 engineers working at Netflix. Um, and I was once um, at a, a conference, and I was talking to a guy um, who worked in the telecom industry for, for a number of years, and he asked, when I told him how many engineers worked here, he's like, well, why do you need so many engineers at Netflix to stream video? Right? 1,200, that's a lot. Uh, and so it goes to what Gall calls the operational fallacy. Uh, and the operational fallacy is that the, the thing that the system says it's doing is not really what it spends most of its time doing. Um, and a great example of this outside of tech is Harvard, right? <laughs> so you might think that Harvard is a university, but actually uh, it's a, just a huge hedge fund that has this little arm attached to it um, that they use for, you know, to get new investment and to maintain tax-free status. Um, similarly, there's this really great quote from Adrian Cockroft um, who used to be um, a software architect at Netflix. He's now at Amazon. And he says, uh, Netflix is a monitoring company that is an interesting and unexpected byproduct, also streams movies. <laughs> so let's talk about another outage we had. So there's some non-critical service um, in our architecture that failed. It, it happened, I think, to be the AB service at this point in time. So if a, the AB service goes down, we can't run AB tests, but people should still be able to stream videos, right? So the service that was calling into the AV service, um, there was more logging messages, right? Because it was trying to make a call to this non-critical service, there's a failure, it logs it. Uh, this service sends those messages to Kafka. Um, now the problem is that the thread that sends those messages to the Kafka queue um, takes a lock, and that lock is also taken by the application thread. So as more and more um, log messages got generated, um, the application threads were starved of time, right? You have lock contention. And then the system throttled, uh, and we had an outage, right? Um, so the logging system took down production. And, you know, you don't need logging to stream video, but we do. It's a support system. Uh, another example uh, from a different organization, from Amazon, uh, about five years ago, they had an EVS outage. So that's elastic block storage. That's their persistent disk system. Um, so when US East 1 in uh, one of their availability zones, EVS went out. Uh, and so there's multiple contributory factors here, but the one that I thought was most interesting was that there is a memory leak bug in the agent that monitors the health of the EVS service, right? So this is a system that doesn't provide EVS functionality, but it makes sure that EVS is working properly, and that system failed, and that led to an outage. Let's talk about mitigation. Uh, so there's another Amazon outage uh, in S3 a few uh, months ago, right? Um, so according to their, you know, they published postmortem. Uh, their billing process was slow, and they're trying to debug this. Uh, there was an engineer who was trying to take some uh, server offline to help debug this problem. Um, that engineer entered some, some command incorrectly, took too many servers offline, uh, and then, you know, S3 uh, had a problem. 
So I have this conjecture that I've been developing. Uh, and that is that, that once your system gets large enough and you, you've you know, solved the simple problems, that all your incidents are going to be because there's some support system that behaves in some weird way, or that you're trying to fix some other issue, minor issue, and in doing so, you make the problem worse. So to recap this part of the talk, the, the antics part, um, we, we have to use mechanisms to improve availability, right? We have no choice. So things like error handling, like support systems, like mitigation, but those things can also cause new problems, right? And, and that's what's so hard about building reliable systems. All right, second part of the talk. Let's talk about drift. So we really like to talk about uh, root causes when there's an incident occurs, right? Like, why did the system fail, right? What was the problem? Um, and uh, Sidney Decker talks about this, this trying to search for the broken part, right? Like for us, it's like, where's the bug in the code that caused the system to fail? Where's the, the incorrect configuration option that, that led to this problem? And typically, we'll say, well, you know, um, you know, someone was sloppy, right? Someone was careless, they didn't, you know, do enough testing, or they didn't, you know, review their changes well enough. And we talk a lot about blameless postmortems in our field because it's so tempting to not do that, right? To actually find well, what the person that was responsible for the broken part um, and, and blame them for the problem. Um, and so we talk about, you know, you should really, we need to be more careful, right? And if we're more careful, um, then we will not fail in the future. Or we'll fail less often. So Decker has an alternate perspective. He says that this sort of hindsight broken part thing, it's not that useful uh, for, for keeping us from failing in the future, and that we should look at it in a different kind of way. And he calls his theory drift into failure. Uh, and he has five different concepts in this theory, and I'm going to talk about four of them. Uh, and how they relate to, um, to distributed systems. So one of them is this thing that he calls unruly technology, right? That, that we, we build our systems out of stuff that we really don't fully understand how it's going to behave. Uh, and I think this is really, really true uh, in software, right? Software is just really hard to reason about. It's hard for us as human beings to figure out what our software is going to do. And in particular, we can't build large-scale models of how our system's going to behave. We can, there's some interesting work in, in small-scale models and model checking and stuff like that. We really can't build large-scale models that will predict things like how the Netflix service is going to behave. Um, Peter Alvaro, who's a professor at University of California, Santa Cruz, and has uh, talked here strangely previously, has this really great phrase that I love. And he says, fault tolerance isn't composable. You, you don't get a fault-tolerant system by taking you know, fault-tolerant pieces and putting them together. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, the way Gall puts it is you can't figure out how a complex system is going to fail in general just by looking at how it's put together. Or more generally, you know, your, your system's going to fail in, in all sorts of ways that you, know, you, you cannot possibly even know. Uh, and, and to really drive this home, there was this great paper um, at the University of Washington where they looked at uh, three different distributed systems that had been uh, implemented using formal methods, right, and formally proven correct, and they still found bugs in those systems. Um, and what's really fascinating about that, so if you're not that familiar with formal methods, you have some formal specification of your code, and then you have an implementation, and you, you prove that the implementation is consistent with the specification, but this code has to run on you know, real operating systems, and so your system has to interact with the OS, right? It's got to interact with, make networking calls and, and write to disk and so on. So you need to have some sort of specification as to how the OS primitives behave. And all the, most of the bugs they found were in that specification they wrote about the operating system. Right? So the formally verified parts actually worked properly. They didn't find any bugs in them. But it's these damn interfaces that we have to deal with uh, where we run into trouble. Right? Interfaces are dangerous, and we know that. That's why we don't rely only on unit tests. But we can't get away from that. We can't get away from interfaces. Uh, the second concept he talks about is uh, scarcity and competition. So this is the idea that we're always resource constrained. In particular, we're time constrained, right? Whatever we're doing, we don't have an arbitrary amount of time to you know, verify that everything is correct, right? We have schedule pressure, we work in competitive environments, um, and so we have to make trade-offs. In particular, we're always making these trade-offs between efficiency, how much work we can get done, and thoroughness, how, much, how you know, complete we can do on any one given task. Um, and this trade-off is sort of endemic everywhere. And this, uh, another safety researcher, Eric Hollandegel, called this the Edo principle, right? The efficiency thoroughness trade-off. We are always, always making these trade-offs every day between being efficient and being thorough. Um, and so, once again, this is uh, a guy writing, a pediatrician in the 70s, right? <laughs> writing about systems. Uh, this is not unique to us as, as software engineers, right? This is part of being a human being, uh, is that we create these temporary patches, we make trade-offs between efficiency and thoroughness. 
and eventually those things are, are going to bite us. Um, so the third concept is called decrementalism. So that's, uh, uh, but decrementalism means that the drift, the system's getting at dangerous states, that happens sort of slowly. It's not like the system is safe and then all of a sudden somebody, you know, does something and the system is unsafe and then a failure happens. Instead it happens, happens incrementally over time. So as an example, when is it all right to push to production? So at Netflix, we make heavy use of what are called canary deployments. So when we're ready to push to prod, we don't replace all the servers um, running the code, the old code, with the new one. Instead, we replace just a few. We create a, a smaller cluster uh, with just you know, a very small number of nodes. A fraction of production traffic goes to those nodes, and we look to see if those are behaving correctly, right? If there's not too many errors, uh, the, the latencies are all right. Um, then we say, okay, it's safe, the canary passed. And we actually have some automated tooling. We can automatically compare canaries to baselines and see if they behave similarly, and then once that's done, we can deploy the entire new cluster to prod. Um, so there was one day where the canary failed, right? So there was a problem with the canary deployment uh, based on the automated canary analysis system, but the engineers looked at the change that was made and they said, you know what, this is an innocuous looking change. Sometimes the canary fails for some transient reason. Um, we're just going to push to production anyways, right? Um, <laughs> now, so, so this is actually super unfair to the engineers involved in this because this isn't, isn't what actually happened in this case, but I really love that, that particular tweet. In this case, that change they were looking at was innocuous. It wasn't the source of the problem. The, the bug in the code had been introduced many builds before, many days before, but it hadn't been noticed because it only manifested when there was a change in um, traffic patterns. Now, that new canary that got deployed, that change happened and that canary failed, but they didn't look into that, uh, that particular reason for the failure. They just said, oh, you know, is it because of the most recent change? No, it isn't. Okay, it's probably safe. And so um, this is sort of a general problem that we have, right? When we have some sort of, you know, end-to-end -end testing system and it's kind of flaky and, you know, the tests don't pass every time. And so we look and we say, okay, you know, 95% passed. Those tests are flaky. It's probably okay. And then we go through with it and it usually is okay, right? And this happens again and again over time. And you can see how over time you can get sort of less thorough about how you're checking things because you're making those trade-offs and when you make them, it seems like it's safe, right? You're, there's no negative feedback initially. And Diane Vaughn, who is a sociology researcher who looked at, in the wake of the Challenger explosion uh, at, you know, uh, practice at NASA, called this behavior normalization of deviance, where slowly over time, within an organization, their, you know, how strict or thorough they are sort of degrades, but it happens very slowly, and people inside don't notice that change. And so if you're coming in from outside, you would say, wow, I can't believe you're doing this. And I have to admit, I've been on many software projects where a new person has come in and I'm like, oh, you know, our, our deployments aren't fully automated here, I feel really bad about that, or, you know, we're not testing this part. But, you know, day to day we don't say anything, right? Uh, and so this is part of, you know, us being humans and building systems. The last one I want to talk about in terms of, of drift is um, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Uh, some people call this path dependence. Or, or history, right? And so the, the thing is that, that systems, you don't build large systems out of nowhere, they evolve over time uh, from, from sp smaller systems. Uh, so, so Gall made this observation, right? He says that, you, you know, if you ever find some large complex system, it didn't, didn't just get created that way. It, it evolved, someone made a small system and it worked and they grew that system. Um, and that became a large system. And that has all sorts of consequences, right? Because people made decisions a long time ago that are gonna affect you now and that you have no idea and that they had no idea. The problem is that we can only make local decisions, right? If you're writing code and you're saying, well, how should I respond to this particular error condition? What should I do? You're making a local decision. Uh, and that can have some impact, you know, somewhere else entirely that you, you won't know in general. So as an example on Netflix, we have this service called EV Cache. This is an, an in-memory, uh, you know, volatile cache. It's used very often for performance. Uh, and so here's a scenario. There's three services um, that talk to each other. There's a playback service that talks to the URL service, which talks to an EV cache cluster. And so the URL service uh, is not a critical service. If it fails, the playback service has some fallback logic that it'll execute. So one day, there was a traffic spike. Uh, which is interesting because it's not that common at Netflix. Our, our traffic patterns are pretty predictable. Um, people watch uh, somewhat predictably if, when you aggregate them. In this case, the traffic spike saturated the network interface cards on the EV cache clusters. Uh, and so they became latent and started to time out. Uh, now the EV cache client code in the URL service uh, 
um, tried to hit EV cache, it failed, and it was configured to, to treat that failure as a cache miss, as if the data wasn't there. Uh, so playback, the playback service can handle the real service failing, but it can't handle the real service saying, ah, the data's just not there. Uh, and then we had an outage. So you might say, well, why is it configured that way? And it, uh, so that's the default, right? They didn't set it that way. The default configuration for the EV cache client is to treat errors as misses. Uh, but it turns out that that's actually the right thing to do in most cases, because the client is going to retry on its own. And what would happen previously, that wasn't always the default, and people didn't handle that error case properly. The EV cache and people were doing too many timeouts because the client was doing timeouts. They would get an error, those would do timeouts. They would interpret their own errors as EV cache errors. And so the EV cache team changed that behavior. It was right for most people, but not for this case, and they didn't know. Um, so Vaughn, once again, has this notion of structural secrecy. And that means that the information that you need to know to make a decision is somewhere else in the organization and you don't have access to it. So Netflix is a really, really open organization and we're co-located, right? All the engineers are on the same campus and we still have this problem, right, as we grow, that sometimes you're gonna need information to make a decision and you won't have access to it because it's some, some other part of the organization that you didn't know about. So to recap the drift part of this talk, uh, so we're kind of in trouble here because of the way software is and because of the way humans are, because of the way we act when we're resource constrained, because we can only make local decisions uh, that have non-local impact, and because of history that we can't control, sometimes even don't even know about, those can all lead to systems getting into unsafe states uh, that eventually lead to, to failures. All right, so what can we do about this? Uh, so we can do some things. Uh, so in Netflix we have this service called Chaos Monkey. Uh, and so what Chaos Monkey does is it runs in the background and it automatically uh, terminates servers that run in production, right? Um, so here is a picture of the uh, Chaos Monkey dashboard. You can see we're doing about six terminations a minute of servers at, at Netflix. You can also see that somewhere around 2.40, uh, there's this terminate label and it stops for a while. And that's Nef Chaos Monkey killing itself uh, and then coming back. So. <laughs> So you can opt out of Chaos Monkey if you want to. It's opt, uh, it's opt out. Uh, but Chaos Monkey's opted in and, it, you know, nothing happens if Chaos Monkey just doesn't kill things for a while. Um, so the reason for Chaos Monkey is that we want to make the wrong thing harder, right? When Netflix moved from data centers to the cloud, they were running on, um, on servers that were much less reliable, right, that are, that are commodity grade. And so the engineers had to write their services to be able to tolerate those failures. But we can't impose how people design stuff in Netflix. We have like freedom and responsibility, teams are free to do what they want. So what we can do is make the wrong thing harder, to, to create more pain for engineers if they write their services to be stateful, to not have retries and things like that. Um, and it was successful, right? And Chaos Monkey works, it's on, it you know, doesn't cause many outages anymore because people are writing resilient services. Every once in a while there's a Snowflake server and it goes down and we don't write Snowflake servers anymore. Um, and so what we're trying to do at Netflix is kind of generalize this approach uh, to something that we're calling chaos engineering. And the idea behind chaos engineering uh, is that because we can't build models that describe how our, our systems are gonna behave, what we can do is we can take an empirical approach and we can experiment on our services, on our system to figure out what it does, right? Uh, in particular, what we're doing um, at Netflix is we're doing chaos engineering because we want to figure out where our vulnerabilities are. Well, the system has gotten into an unsafe state and to identify those vulnerabilities before they become outages and then, and then root them out. And we do these experiments in production. And we do them because sort of we have to, right? Because we don't have a perfect representation of how production is, right? There's, we have a test environment, but it doesn't really look like production. And we can't fully replicate all the data and all the configuration and the traffic patterns and everything. And so um, scientists call this problem the external validity problem, right? When you run an experiment, the only way to know for sure that it generalizes to a population is to do it on that population. And that's why we do drug testing on people and not just on, on animals or on petri dishes, right? In petri dishes. And so the only way to get the full external validity um, is to do these kinds of experiments directly in production. And so uh, one of the risks that we're trying to mitigate is we want to make sure that Netflix is not vulnerable to a non-critical service going down that we thought was non-critical but actually ends up being critical. So um, we have a lot of services, so this is sort of like a screenshot of, of, of the Netflix uh, uh, microservice architecture. This is a screenshot of a tool called Visceral that was also written at Netflix. Um, and so most of our services are not critical, right? So there's a service that remembers where you were if you stopped watching a movie, the bookmark service, and then you can resume from the bookmark. Um, if that goes down and the user has to you know, start from the beginning, it's annoying, but it's not a critical thing. So we have this internal tool called Chat. 
um, which we, it's called the Chaos Automation Platform, which we use to design and, and execute these, these kinds of experiments at, at Netflix. So I'm gonna take our you know, EV cache example again and show you how um, if we had done an experiment in advance, we might have been able to catch this one. Uh, so the question is, are we vulnerable to the EV cache clusters timing out? So what we do with CHAP is we take the URL service and we clone it twice to create two smaller clusters, a control cluster and an experiment cluster. Then what we do is we route a fraction of the production traffic that would normally go to the URL service to these control clusters and experiment clusters. Finally, we, um, we inject latency in the calls from the experiment cluster to EV cache to, to replicate the, the failure problem. And then we look at the difference, right? So we look at uh, the difference in the behavior of those two clusters, control and experiment, and we look at the behavior of the people that got assigned to the control group and the experiment group to see if there are differences. Uh, and if there are no differences, then everything's great, and if there are, then we look in and, and see if there's something wrong. So we have the, these general principles on how to um, design and run chaos experiments, so you can go read about them at principlesofchaos.org. I'm just gonna walk through them pretty briefly here and, and give examples from, from chat that I just showed. So one, when you do these chaos experiments, you wanna build some sort of hypothesis about how your system's gonna behave um, when, when you're injecting things into it. And so you typically have some steady state behavior of the system, and you wanna see if that steady state has been changed in some way. So at Netflix, one of our big, biggest um, you know, business metrics is what we call stream starts per second, or SPS. This is the number of people who hit the play button and successfully can stream a video, right? It's actually a pretty predictable diurnal pattern for us. Um, and so when we do an experiment, we look at SPS for the control and experiment groups. And if the experiment group drops, if they can't stream as much video, we know there's some kind of problem when we fail the non-critical service. The second one is to very real world events. You're gonna inject something into your system as part of your experiment, right? That's the treatment that you're doing. So with CHAP, we're typically either failing an RPC call, so we're injecting a failure, um, or we're adding latency to a call, as you saw in the example earlier. So typically, you know, right near a timeout. If we delay it up to the timeout or after the timeout, what happens? Third, um, and I mentioned this earlier, we try to run our experiments in production as much as we can. So we do all our experiments in production. Um, and what we do is we route production traffic from the trap to the trap clusters, um, only a fraction of it, but it, it's real prod traffic. Um, we automate, right? And the challenge is that our system is frequently undergoing change, right, constantly. And so if you do an experiment today, it might not hold tomorrow. Uh, the URL service was a non-critical service. It happens today to be critical because of changes to it. Um, so we integrate with our deployment pipelines, right? So we have a Spinnaker, a deployment pipeline system, and we can run our CHAP experiments here. So they run on a regular basis, like a cron job, or you can have them as part of your deploys. Finally, we try to minimize the blast radius, right? It is dangerous to do stuff in production. Um, so what we do is we, we only route a small fraction of traffic to limit the total amount of um, traffic that could be impacted. And we have this auto stop functionality. So if we detect early on in the experiment that the users are experiencing pain, then we just stop the experiment. So, takeaways from this talk. One is, systems behave like in really weird ways, right? Like they're pathological. Um, but you can use chaos experiments to write out some of those pathologies. The second one is that these systems get into unsafe states because human beings are making reasonable decisions, right? It's not just people are being like sloppy uh, or aren't or are stupid, right? Th these are reasonable people making reasonable decisions that's leading to, to systems getting into unsafe states. And, and so if you do chaos like Chaos Monkey or you automate your experiments, you can provide incentives to people so that the drift doesn't happen as much, right? So if they, start, if they start loosening up on their standards, but then you run an experiment and boom, they see the problem, then hopefully um, they'll catch it and they, they won't um, slide back as much. And the last takeaway I'm going to end with here is if you get nothing else in this talk, you should really read these. These are great books you should read. Um, so the one on the left is uh, Systems Bible by John Gall. Um, the middle one is Drift into Failure by Sidney Decker. Um, the last one happens to be a book written by, by my teammates and I, uh, and we're giving that book away for free at the Chaos, at the Chaos, at the Netflix booth uh, on the third floor. And it's not just Chaos. Uh, there's other things at Netflix over 1,200 engineers, uh, and so we're, we're giving this away. Um, so if you wanna come talk to me, uh, just come right after the talk, and I'm happy to talk. Thank you. <laughs>